Moment, ich glaube, Gaspel. Ich glaube, Gaspel. Motivation. Uh, I thank you for joining me to that group. And uh, yeah, um, I see you have a lot of video messages for, for African pastors, and so I thought maybe I can contribute a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'm a missionary in Nicaragua, but I'm actually a missionary since one year only, and I don't have so much experience. But uh, I do have experience, and uh, in Switzerland I had mental illness for 14 years, and I had a, a lot of struggling, 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 and persevering, 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 and I'm not a very, very holy person. I have a lot of character flaws, a lot of frustration from the 14 years of mental illness, and also a past of quite some rebellion. and. Uh, so I do have to be careful about my character and I have to have uh, get uh, more healing in my character also in, uh, in terms of rejection and self-acceptance and self-love. And that's what my prayer focus is. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about my ministry and, and also about the history of Switzerland, where I come from. And and about the strengths of Switzerland, spiritual strengths and spiritual weaknesses and what God has taught me to, to fight the spirit of poverty and, and a lot of, lot of things regarding poor countries like Africa. And uh, yeah, my ministry, I do a, a mercy ministry on, on homeless people and alcoholics. My first aim was to help alcoholics, but it turned out to be too hard because I had not the strength to, to deal with alcoholics also because of my rebellious past it, uh, some people did not obey me I, ha I did, did lack the authority to, to really direct them and to really be to rule over them because I had a rebellious past myself so uh, actually it was one guy he was an alcoholic and uh, it was too hard to really help him. I couldn't sleep anymore. He came home at one in the morning every night, and he was drunk, and it, it was get, it was too much for my nerves. And I needed rest because of my mental illness past. And it's important that I have my sleep, so I had to have get him out of the ministry. And the others, they were not alcoholics; they were past alcoholics. And so what we did, we have now a house with like six people, six homeless folks. And yeah, it was this year. It was it was a struggle. It was a tremendous struggle. I was once we got kicked out of my office because I partly because of that alcoholic, partly because of me. I was praying for one lady. She was a Catholic and she was also homeless, and she was praying like four hours in the in the at the cross of the Catholic Church. And uh, I, I touched my heart and I wanted to help her and I started praying for her and God showed me a lot of things like uh, her prayer was, was idolatry and she was very religious so she was captivated in this Catholic, in this Catholic stuff and I started praying to get her out of there but it was, it was a tremendous, tremendous fight to get her out of this Catholic church. And finally I realized, yeah, I did a lot of mistakes in this prayer war. And so we got kicked out of my apartment of my office. And I had to go back to the house with the six with the six lads I'm I'm helping them to whom I am helping. And so I got panic, I couldn't I built up my computer, we had no internet, I had no mouse, so I couldn't work because I also have a job to finance my ministry and so I ran away from the ministry and because I had built up that ministry like half a year and also was in Switzerland to get money for it and I just ran away, I lost hope of about half a year and that was like losing a massive, massive hope and so I completely lost my mind. And I ended up 
waking up in the street and, and being crazy and uh, I, I went to, to, to the prison and I was four days in prison and in the prison one lady she made a prayer night for me because the Christians they saw me in the prison and so I made a small advance in the prison and my mind came back to me and I realized hey I'm a missionary I'm from Switzerland what do I do here in the prison and so I started praying getting out of the prison and then maybe after a quarter of an hour that lady showed up and she got me out of the prison and another time I was in mental hospital here it was I tell you I, I four times I maybe I risked my life here in this year for my ministry and uh, yeah we two two houses I had to drop and now we have a third house and we're gonna try another time but now I have a, a, an apartment here this apartment you see here it's I live together with one of the homeless guys and we have a quiet time but as long as we have rented this house here I want I want to try and go back because the alcoholic guy is not there anymore and I want to try another time but this time I want to do it smarter I want to just spend two weeks there sleeping there have my office there and if it doesn't work out I can always come back here but it was a fight folks <laughs> and but I learned a lot about poverty you see I come from Switzerland I didn't know much about poverty uh, I did know quite some stuff about the authority of the Word of God and about faith and about perseverance and about uh, not accepting your circumstances but uh, believe, trust in the Word of God so one of my things I do I say in my life the circumstances bow their knees before the Word of God and not the Word of God before my circumstances and usually as a missionary if you live in Switzerland you have a medi medical insurance you have the best hospitals and everything you have a lot of security from money you know and uh, when you come here as a missionary you lose all those securities and so you quite quickly learn to just only trust in the Word of God as your security and that gives you a tremendous trust in the Word of God and you see it's actually more security than the finances and the money could have ever given to you and so a lot of when I came here a lot of Nicaraguans uh, we went we had one house in a, in a drug uh, barrio in a drug uh, region where a lot of drug addicts were and the Nicaraguans say yeah that's dangerous there you must not go there there are a lot of drug addicts and the first time a Nicaraguan told me that's dangerous there you must not walk there because there was a guy in a wheelchair there and I wanted to carry him to, to the church every Sunday and I said well if I start that way in half a year I'm going back to Switzerland because that's what the devil wants me to do he wants me to say oh there's dangerous and there's dangerous and there's dangerous and in the end everywhere is dangerous and I have to go back no he just wants me to panic about every spot here in Granada so I have to go back because if you don't want dangerous you need to go to Switzerland no <laughs> and so I realized no it's the same like with Elisha Elisha he saw the the army of the angels and and his his servant Gehazi he didn't see the angels so he thought it's dangerous the army of the Syrians who attacked uh, Jerusalem and I didn't see the angels neither but I knew the Word of God says in Psalm 91 uh, he command nothing evil shall come past you because he commanded his angels to guard you to put uh, to carry you upon their hands so you don't hit your feet against the stone so I knew as long as I confess this psalm and I proclaim this psalm and don't proclaim yeah it's dangerous it's dangerous it's dangerous as long as I confess that psalm the angels are here even though if I don't see them and so that was my confession always when a Nicaraguan said it's dangerous I said sorry man there are four angels around me and they are protecting me I never saw those angels but that I just said it no and never it didn't happen never then never happened anything and the angels were always here no and I had always protection and it wasn't dangerous even though once they tried to steal my my bag but there was another guy there was a group and they tried to take my back but I had total peace and another guy said hey, no this is a good guy leave him in peace don't steal this and I was always friendly to the drug addicts I made friends with them no sometimes I gave them 10 pay so I helped them a little bit 
we, we made a, a home group, we, we sung worship songs, and it's in Nicaragua, this is easy, because everybody fears God, even even the, 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 uh, the ultimate drug dealer, even he fears God, and you can, you can do church service even with the ultimate drug dealer, because everybody knows about God. And so, there were actually, very soon my friends, the drug addicts, and so we went into that house there, and well, once, one came up and he he played if he wa if he wanted to kill me and he he stabbed me here a bit but I just confessed Psalm 91 nothing ill shall come past you but I confessed in German I proclaimed in German he didn't understand but he went away and he left me no nothing happened but there was another problem uh, that made us leave this bar if one of those was uh, of course one problem was the alcoholic in the house he came home at one in the morning he was drunk and he was shouting at me, at me half an hour at one in the morning fuck you Simon fuck you Simon and I had no authority to really to really reign over him because I also had a rebellious past so it, it didn't work and he was one of the problems and we had a lot of demons in the house because he also smoked weed and stuff like this and and also there was constant strife in the house between two different groups because we because i started the ministry with him with him and some other guy and then I, we joined the other lads in another house and we tried to combine two groups into one ministry and so it was difficult and then but what I another thing I learned was about the poverty because that was our one of our problems was laziness in that house because at the other side of the street there was this guy in the wheelchair and he was an interesting guy he was a former Catholic but he came to our church and he as he was in a wheelchair he was very poor and uh, his whole family he had a wife and three daughters but I think he some of the daughters or even all of them he adopted and also the other folks in the house I don't know if he adopted them and the wives the women they were working and the, the men they were so so lazy they were they were not working and they were just hanging around all day long or playing cards and because they didn't work they had to sell drugs no that was the only means to get that money for them and so what happened, I was in the other, at the other side of the street and at the other side of our house, at the same side of the street, was an empty house. And then I realized, man, what is this laziness in our house? We, we are growing into a depression if we continue like this. I started, I realized we are growing more lazy and more lazy and more lazy. And I put the kitchen on the street. I don't know why I did this, but I kind of felt we have to defend ourselves against this laziness, so we put our work spot right on the street, right in front of the street, right on our on our veranda, no? And so we put the kitchen there, and my lads, they were just sitting around there. They were hanging around, and I start feeling, it's, it's feeling more lazy and more lazy and more lazy here. If we continue like this, we all grow into a depression. It's dangerous. We are six people in the house. If we all grow in, into a depression, we're going to die. It's very dangerous. And so I got a lot of stress. And one of the lads from my ministry, he was mentally ill. He w was mentally handicapped. And he was the laziest one of all. And I realized I have to do something against this laziness. And so I, I tried with sports. And I said, let's go jogging every morning. And then three guys came with me. The others didn't come. They went for work. And three guys came and we went for sports. Also the mentally handicapped guy. And it was crazy. He was maybe running five meters and then he had to vomit all this spirit of laziness out of him. He could run five meters and then he had to vomit. There was such a spirit of laziness in him and I realized maybe his mental handicapness also had to do with laziness. I was, I'm not sure, but, but that was uh, well, probably both, no? And so... Uh, I realized I'm gonna lose this fight against laziness because I did not realize I have to also repent for it. I did not repent for it, I just tried to fight it and I, I saw I'm gonna lose this fight and I couldn't sleep anymore and I had to leave the house because I was afraid of we all grow into a depression. And uh, so uh, 
but what I also was seeing that the women, every morning they left the house and, and swept the street with a broom, every morning. And in Switzerland, women, they don't do this. No, there's some women, maybe once a week, they sweep, they sweep uh, the, the place in front of the house, but not every day, you know. And I realized they, they don't weep, sweep the, the street because of, so the street gets, gets uh, clean. They sweep the street to, to fight the laziness, to get the laziness to defend their house against the laziness. That's the reason why they sweep the street. And, I, and I re, I did, in, the, in the beginning, we did not sweep our street. And all the lazy people, they crossed the street at our side when they crossed the street and not on their side. And I realized we have to sweep the street also. So the lazy people get, get away from our house and the spirit doesn't come close to our house. And so I I worked like a like a like a yeah like a crazy guy in Switzerland. I worked in a retirement home. I, I know how to be diligent. I know how to work. No, and I even had medication in that work. I had to work like like a crazy guy. So I started. Well, I I know how to be diligent. Let's let's sweep that street. And I swept that street like a crazy man. And when I was finished that sweeping that street, you see, in, in Nicaragua, it oftentimes feels like, why, why is there kind of darkness here? There's, it's kind of darkness. And when I had swept that street, that was, there was so much light on that street, I was, hey, this is Switzerland. Wow, this street must be in Switzerland. Now it feels like Switzerland. Now the street feels like Switzerland. And I realized this darkness is the spirit of poverty. And in Switzerland, you feel, you know where I feel this. It's all, uh, because people are very diligent. Everybody is diligent. And so there's almost no spirit of poverty in Switzerland. And it feels like a lot of light and no darkness. And also there's almost no idolatry in Switzerland. No, yeah, of course, witchcraft. There is witchcraft in Switzerland. There's a lot of Masonics and Satanists. But not, not many idolatry, almost no idolatry. The Catholics, they don't celebrate idolatry that open. So there's almost no idolatry. And I realized also because of this prayer warfare for that Catholic woman, I realized the idolatry is the main source for the spirit of poverty. The idolatry of the Catholics. In, here in Nicaragua, they, have, they celebrate the Immaculada, the, the Virgin Mary, once a year. They, celebrate and they have a lot of idols in the churches and in their homes and this is the main source for poverty in this country and also for the other problems like alcoholism and worshipping of women because yeah they also have problems in marriage because a lot of Nicaraguan men are very weak men and the wives are very strong and this is also because of this Mary worship I believe so that the men start worshipping their women and worshiping femininity, you know, and, um, and wives get proud very fast. And I think this is also because of this Mary cult. And so I realized uh, um, we need to fight this laziness in our house. And I also remembered some scriptures, you no know, uh, proverb says a lazy hand makes, makes uh, poor and a, a diligent hand makes rich. And I don't know, I didn't seek for more scripture about laziness and about diligence. I know some, some Bible verses about go to the aunt, your lazy guy, and learn from her. If, even though she doesn't have a, a, a king, she collects her food in the summer. And other verses about laziness, no, sleep a bit, and, and then the poverty will will uh, will conquer you like a, uh, a weaponed man. I know other verses, but not that much, no? I'm not so founded in, in, pro in verses about diligence and laziness in the Bible. But I started realizing there is, a, there is a connection between poverty and laziness, and between laziness and idolatry, or poverty and idolatry. I started re realizing there's a direct connection. And as my ministry is about helping homeless, 
also one of my focuses is to help economically, no, not just spiritually. This is a, a very important focus. But also one of the other focuses is to help this nation economically and to help the homeless folks with work, with, with money, with, with a home, with food. And so I started realizing, no, it has to do also with their laziness that they are homeless. Because if they don't work, the Bible says, who, who does not want to work shall not eat. And so God does not allow them uh, growing wealthy because they're lazy and don't want to work it's like kind of a of a, of a just yeah, it's it's righteous no and even in my work I had work here in an office with with a programming job even I have a very I had a very hard time working I was distracted so much and I realized what's wrong here and since eight months I'm trying to finish my software and I cannot get on some I don't make progress really like I did in Switzerland and I realized even though their laziness is influencing my progress in my work whereas in Switzerland I don't have any problems with that work I had I worked one month and I got $1,500 for it and here I'm working since nine months and I didn't see zero dollars I did I did make some progress but there was something broken and there was something broken and always there was something broken in my software and I never could finish it and maybe it's my own laziness but maybe it's also the laziness of the people in my ministry that brings a curse upon my work so I or the spirit of poverty into my work so I cannot finish my work so I cannot get at the money and yeah so I realized diligence it's a key it's a key factor of having wealth in your ministry getting your people diligent but uh, when I returned now like two weeks ago in, in the new house we have I realized you cannot just be strict with people and try to get them diligent because oftentimes they don't want to No, they want to be lazy and they don't want to work and that's how they want it to be and I, me, me too I don't like this in Switzerland we, we put this to the extreme we are so diligent Switzerland sometimes it seems like a slave house no everybody is working 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 and working is the ultimate goal of of, of Swiss people no there they live for work and that's not the purpose of our life our, the purpose of our life is not just to work we we need to have fun with Jesus and to honor God and also spend time in prayer and Switzerland is a very atheistic country so people merely only work 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 and when they don't work, they, they go and seek some fun in the cinema, in restaurants, in, in having party, you know, and that's what their life is about. And of course, this is, <coughs> this is totally not my intention for my life. You no, know, I, I want to, I don't want to work, 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 work all my life. I want to be diligent, but I also want to be with my God and to enjoy my God and, and to and to have quiet time with my God and to have sometimes vacation with my God. No, and also in the Bible you see God put the sabbatical every seven years. He, he made a sabbatical. So God is not someone who constantly works, 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 works. That's, that's not God. Also Jesus, he was a carpenter. But he went to a lot of weddings and he had a lot of party also. No? He was not a guy who was only about working. And so I realized you need to, in order to, to change your people in the ministry, you cannot force it upon them, but you need, in order that Jesus can change them, in your prayers, you need to repent for them. You need to repent for them that they have been lazy all their lives, that they did not want to work. And you need to apply the word of God, like, uh, Lord, give me, give me a, 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 a new heart, create in me a new heart and give me a willing spirit. And that's how I need to pray, proclaim the word of God over them and pray the word of God over them because that's my experience. Praying the word of God is way more powerful than just just prayer. prayer. Praying the word of God always is more powerful than just prayer. So when I pray, a lot of times I pray with the word of God. I pray psalms. Also for people I need to pray, I do pray psalms over them in order my prayer have more power. My prayers have more power. And so... 
I need if I need to change the will of those lads so they have they are ready to be more diligent I need to pray the word of God over them like God created me a new heart and and give me a willing spirit or I need to repent for all their sin of laziness because laziness is sin so I need to repent for it so the Holy Spirit actually can cleanse them from that sin if no one repents and they themselves don't repent the Holy Spirit cannot change them no? it's impossible that you can pray and pray and pray first you need to repent for your sin and confess the sins so the Holy Spirit the blood of Jesus can cleanse them from this laziness so the Holy Spirit can change them and so a lot of my prayers were repenting about their laziness and also to be diligent for them but oh my god I really if I had to be diligent for them I had to be diligent for six people oh my god that was hard but I'm a Swiss so I know I how to do this but oh my god I tell you folks this was hard no but I remembered all the Swiss missionaries oh my god in Elfen in Ivory Coast how they did the coffee plantages and the banana plantages and also the the guy who brought the banana plantages to Costa Rica here it was I think it was also a Swiss missionary who introduced the banana industry here in Costa Rica so that was always the Swiss missionaries that was the strength of them to to bring economical blessing too. to be, it, through their diligence they always grew also economical stuff in a country that turned later into an economical blessing for the whole country of course oftentimes the devil also misused it we know in Ivory Coast nowadays a lot of child slaves have to work in those cacao plantages but if people would pray now if we pray I think God's gonna use it for good but also the devil did misuse this stuff of course also but it's not only yeah but uh, intentionally it was meant to bless the country you know and so that's one strength of Swiss missionaries you no know? because they are diligent and they know how to be diligent and that's if they have this authority they can bring this to, to the people you no, know? and can bring economical blessing to people and yeah so that's what I've learned about fighting the spirit of poverty and also sports is a good means if you do sports with your people in your ministry it's a good means of growing in diligence and also spiritual life is the same you also need to develop diligence in your spiritual life and that's some, something I was very weak in the past because I had a depression for for three years and I almost lost all my diligence in my spiritual life I was full of medication I couldn't pray anymore because I had to work and all, every time I wanted to pray I fell asleep after two minutes so I for eight years I kind of had only very little prayer life and I realized you have to repent for your laziness in your spiritual life too yourself and so I, I started this also and God did change quite a bit since I repented for my laziness in my spiritual life God changed quite a bit and uh, I think we, we just need to keep keep on confessing and oftentimes we don't recognize our sin that laziness is a sin no oftentimes we don't recognize the problems and we we don't we don't we don't grasp we need to ask for wisdom to solve our problems and not just pray 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 we oftentimes we need to ask for wisdom God show me how do I need to solve this problem no? and the prayer for wisdom oftentimes is the most important prayer and yeah and uh, I did write to some Ghanaian guy lately about the spirit of poverty and as you teach these things now you you grow yourself into in wisdom and in in, in, uh, in uh, knowledge and so we had discussion about school and about also no, about mainly about spirit of poverty and one problem in, in poor countries especially for pastors I see this here in Nicaragua a lot is that making having a ministry is one of the ways of getting wealth in that country it's a, it's it's one of the rare ways of getting wealth in Nicaragua only few people can go to university can make a high high higher education to to really get out of poverty only few people have the money to start a business they can start business but only very small business and to start a big business no one has the money for but everyone can start a church 
And if you start a church and you, you're on your knees a lot of time, of course the church members, they're going to pay, pay tithes. And so that's a way in Nicaragua to get wealth, to start a church. And this is a trap for pastors in poor countries. It's a huge trap. Because you see so many pastors in this country, you see usually in Nicaragua we eat gallo pinto, that is rice and beans, and actually we eat rice and beans every day. We eat rice and beans for breakfast, we eat rice and beans for dinner, and we eat rice and beans for, for supper. You know? And uh, usually we eat rice and beans and some bananas, and maybe every third day, if a family has more money, then it's more, if a family has less money, it's less. Every third day we eat some pollo or some, some chicken to it, no? And with maybe some tomato sauce and, and that's it. That's it, folks. And you see those pastors and they have huge bellies. And you think, hey man, I lost like 30 kilos here in Nicaragua in one year. I, I only ate rice and beans. I have a lot of money from Switzerland. I, leave, I receive a lot of money from Switzerland. But my money, it has a lot of legs. I'm helping this guy, I'm helping this guy, I'm help, helping the six guys in my ministries. We need this, we need this, we need this. We need food, we need this. And <coughs> I'm constantly paying and all my money goes away. And those pastors, I see them with their bellies and I think, how did you grow this belly, man? How did you grow this belly? You must eat chicken every day, no? And where do you get the money from to eat chicken every day? I don't have this money, even though, though I do have a lot of money, but all the money goes into my ministry. And you see, this is a big, tempta a big, a big trap for pastors, because also I maybe visited like four or five evangelical churches up to now. I was to one gringo, to one American church. It was, it's a beautiful church. They have such a sweet spirit in that church. And there are a lot of missionaries in that church. It's a, a mixed church. It's a lot of Americans, a lot of United States people, and also a lot of Nicaraguan people. The church service is in Spanish and in English. But it has such a sweet spirit. And oftentimes, when I go to Nicaraguan churches, the pastor, he's shouting. He say, well, bendecido, 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 la sangre de Cristo, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the, uh, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. And I always remember that scripture. I don't know where it is. I think in Josiah where it says, we shall not hear his voice in the street, nor his, uh, I don't remember that scripture. It, there's a scripture, it says, that Jesus, we didn't hear his voice in the street and he was not shouting aloud in the street. But he had a meek heart and a meek spirit and he was, he had a soft, when he was preaching he was soft. That, that's the Bible says, no? He didn't shout. And so I realized, well, sorry folks, but Jesus, he didn't preach that way. This is not the spirit of humility. And, and, and once I was going into a church and I was like, Amen, there's so little of the Holy Spirit in that church. What's wrong here? And I realized this pastor, he must be proud. And I started repenting for the pride of the church. I started repenting for the hard-heartedness of that church. Immediately there came a presence of God into that church. And I was like, oh my God, this church never repented for his pride and for his hard-heartedness. And you see in Nicaragua, this is, of course, the Spanish, Spanish culture, it's a proud culture. And because life is hard and everybody has to struggle, it's hard for people to show mercy to poor people. And this is a strength of Switzerland, because we do have so much money, it's very easy to be merciful. And a lot of people are very merciful. If you see some drug addict, oh well, have, have five dollars. Here you have five dollars, go and buy you some bread. <laughs> this is something very easy to do in Switzerland because we have a lot of money. So it's very easy to be merciful to poor people in Switzerland. We don't have a lot of poor people and everybody's nice to, to everybody else. The, 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 the punkers are nice and the evil people are also nice in Switzerland. And the Christians are nice but they're also not so holy. Everybody's just nice in Switzerland. And we have a lot of money so sometimes we give to the poor and but for the, for the wealth we have, for the lot of money we have, we are actually greedy. But at least we do give. No, we are greedy, we don't give much. 
but actually to a drug addict you're not allowed to give much but a lot of Swiss they don't give much or they don't even give at all but the Christians they uh, most of them they are very generous people no and in Nicaragua a lot of Christians they're not generous no they just look for their family they just pray that their family is blessed their kids are blessed God save my kids save my kids save my kids bless my family bless my family bless my family and at the same time, they are not merciful to other poor people. And of course, this this is a total hindrance. The Bible says, "How can this, the love of God stay in your heart if if you if you see your brother like he is poor and you don't help him?" No? And this is also a strength of Swiss of the Christianity in Switzerland. But of course, for Swiss people, it's it's more easy. And I realize this is also a weakness of Christianity here in Nicaragua. They they lack mercy. They really lack mercy and they're proud. But they have strengths we have, we totally don't have in Switzerland. A weakness of Swiss Christianity is we lack totally knowledge about the power and authority of the Word of God because we do trust so much in money, we don't need the authority of the Word of God. Because all our trust in Switzerland, you put all your trust into money. So you don't really need the help of God. You don't. When you're sick, you just go to the hospital. A lot of people don't even pray when they're sick. They don't. They don't uh, have faith for a miracle. They just go to the hospital because they have the money to pay it. So they don't even have the idea God could actually heal them because there's no need for it because the hospital can heal you. No. And in Nicaragua, you don't have all the security money brings. So the people need to trust in the word. They need to have the authority of the word. And they need to have the miracles. And they need to have the faith in the word of God. And their security is the word of God. And so this teaching is very strong here in Nicaragua. And very weak in Switzerland. So Swiss Christians are very, very weak in authority. But they are very strong in mercy. And Nicaraguan Christians, they are very strong in authority, but they are weak in mercy and they are also weak in pride. Because in Switzerland, it's, as a Christian, it's, it's impossible. No, you, of course you can get proud, but you get so much rejection as a Christian because everybody is mocking you. Yeah, you're arrogant, you're proud, you're wrong because we atheists, we have the truth and you are wrong. Science proves you are wrong. You're stupid believing in this book. You get so much insult and rejection. It's easy to stay humble in Switzerland, but in Nicaragua, you're, you're a big guy if you're a Christian and even a missionary, you're a big guy. The whole city knows you and everybody is greeting you. So it's hard to stay humble in Nicaragua as a Christian. And the, the, the atheists are ashamed in Nicaragua. They are the guys who are ashamed. And the Christians are proud to be Christians. And so that's the culture. And, and um, yeah, and I don't know how it is in Africa, uh, but of course yeah in Switzerland I went to some African churches and as I it was a Ghanaian church it was Lighthouse Chapel and as I experienced Lighthouse Chapel they also had serious flaws but they had what they did have they had great worship uh, they had the best worship I ever experienced in my whole life it was such a great worship and uh, yeah the Africans they know how to celebrate party no they know how to dance to sing uh, you see we white folks we don't we have no not the faintest idea of this no and also if you're in a depression you you don't need to listen to white worship you just need to listen to black gospel music and you're very fast you're out of out of the depression because <coughs> I think that's because the bl American black people they have way more authority in suffering than the white people and that's why their music has way more power to heal suffering hearts because their music is is they have suffered way more than the white people so they have mo way more broken hearts and their music brings way more healing to broken hearts and the Afri in Africa I don't know of course it's also a poor continent so they also have authority in suffering and also they know how to celebrate parties so that was that was really amazing in that church in Lighthouse Chapel but uh, I had a pastor he was every second Sunday he was insulting the church of, of not paying tithes he was like yeah and you don't pay tithes and you don't pay tithes and you don't pay tithes and I didn't think much I was happy with that church because of the, because of the because of the because of the worship of course 
and so I didn't think about the, the teaching much and later on I did think about it and I, I, when I read the letter of Galatians especially Galatians 5 once I read Galatians 5 and it says for freedom Christ has set us free so don't let yourself be submitted to the yoke of slavery again and when I read, read that immediately I remembered the sermons of that pastor and I said well that's not what this pastor is preaching he's insulting the church of not paying tithes every second Sunday but I don't believe those folks are paying the tithes you don't need to teach this every second Sunday you need to teach this to the Swiss atheist that maybe that was why this pastor was constantly teaching this maybe he was not preaching this to the church but to the spirits that were around in this city no that's maybe why he constantly preached about the tithes because he had a, a prayer warfare against the spirit in Switzerland that is not paying tithes against the spirit in Christianity in Switzerland that's not paying tithes because in the in the normal churches in Switzerland nobody pays tithes no even though they have the most wealth of, of the whole world and that's a huge sin no and that's why the, this church in Switzerland is so weak those who don't pay tithes no because they're stealing from God and the Bible says you cannot be entrusted the spiritual goods if you don't if you're not faithful with money no and so maybe that was the reason why he was preaching so much on this topic but actually I thought but well but the church we Christians sorry man we do pay tithes you don't need to teach this every Sunday and I realized African a lot of African teachers I don't know why they also have kind of pride they a lot of Africans in Europe Christians I see them there in of course this is you can't say I'm a racist or this is just prejudice it might be prejudice but this is just my observation so let, let's stand it like it is it's my observation I don't want to be a racist or accuse anyone but as I see Africans in in Europe in Switzerland we have a lot of Africans they sell drugs they come to Europe and a lot of them of course they grew up in a poor country I don't know what what has been told to them about Europe in, in Africa and also the guys that come to Europe oftentimes they are the more wealthy guys that can afford to come to Europe but of course it's it's for, for the refugees it's a terrible thing they have to cross the, the Mediterranean they have to cross the Sahara it's something terrible I don't want to judge those people but fact is a lot of them or some of them end up selling drugs in Europe that because this is a very fast way of, of getting to money and it's a lazy way of getting to money and if they uh, didn't uh, get used to diligence in Africa and they're lazy that's what what they end up selling drugs no because this is the way of making money for for the lazy folks the, the, the Bible says who doesn't want to work he shall not eat so if you don't want to work what happens is usually you get you work and you as a reward you get food and, and food is not only food it's also spiritual food you get love you get re, you get respect that's also spiritual food and when you don't want to work you might get food but you lo you lose also the spiritual food that means you have to sell drugs and what is drugs it's the food of the lazy guys in Switzerland they who don't want to work they have to get the love from drugs instead of humans that's how they need to get their love through pills because they don't want to work and so they have to eat pills to get love and also the Africans who are lazy they end up selling drugs and serving this system of, of, of poverty this, this spirit of poverty they cannot escape the spirit of poverty even in Switzerland so they end up selling drugs and but a lot of Christian Africans as they experience them they seem very proud in my eyes like I'm a Christian I'm not a criminal I'm not uh, one of like those drugs dealers I'm a Christian and a lot of Africans that are Christians in Europe in my eyes they're rather proud but maybe it's something natural because they did a they did a, yeah, they did they did a, uh, approach something no they 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 could come from Africa to Europe and they 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 worked hard to to get at this point and so I also see they they achieved really something so there's also a reason to be proud 
it's not only just they are proud, but there's also reason to be proud because they work hard and they really achieved something in their life, but I see they're proud. And also there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of very strange teaching in African churches. A lot of very hard-hearted teaching. And I don't know, is the hard-hearted teaching because of the pride? Or is it because, because uh, Africa only has a history of Christianity like, I don't know, 200 years, 100 years? Because Europe has a history of, of Christianity of 2,000 years. And this, uh, probably the sermon of the Word of God is in Europe since 500 years. We, 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 we get preached the Word of God in Europe. Since 500 years, every Sunday, we hear, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't judge you, lest you be judged. This message is, is around in Europe since 500 years. And in Nicaragua, it's around maybe since 300 years. And in Africa, I don't know, maybe since 200 years, 300 years, 100 years. The, the Basel Mission, the ba ba missionaries from Basel, they were, I think, 100 years ago. So maybe the African preaching preachers oftentimes teach, for, for, my, for my opinion, strange things because they don't have that much of a foundation in Christianity like Europeans have and don't have these this so strong roots in, in mercy. Or maybe even I am wrong and, and we Europeans, we need to preach more strict. That's something I also started when I came to Nicaragua. I realized because of the proud culture and because here Christians, they're not so merciful on sinners. I realized you did preach wrongly in Europe. Because Europeans, there are so many mockers that mock, really mock God in a very ugly way, in a very insulting way. And if you grow up in Europe, you think that's normal. It's everywhere in the world they mock God. No, it's normal. We, we, we are Christians and they are atheists. It's normal. They, they mock God and you think it's normal. And you are merciful with those, even with those mockers. No, you say, okay, Jesus loves you, everything okay. And when I came to Nicaragua, I saw how much those poor lads, how much they honor their God. And you see, there in Nicaragua, every two of three taxis, they have big letters, Bendición de Dios, Blessing of God, Jesus is my pastor. Every two of three taxis is written with huge letters on a taxi. And if some guy wants to buy a taxi, he has to pray and pray and pray and pray. And finally he gets his taxi because of his prayers. He can't, no one can afford a taxi, no? And, and so when I saw this, I really got mad at Europe. I said, wow, this is, well, this is so, those people, they don't have nothing to eat. They only have their knees and their hands to pray to God. That's all they have. And they pray and pray and pray and pray. And God loves them so much. There's so much happiness here in Nicaragua. Way more happiness than in, in, in Switzerland. And we Europeans, we have been blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed with the most wealth of the whole world. The whole world is working for Europe. The Chinese are working for our clothes. I don't know, they have to work 14, 16 hours in the, in the iPhone fabrics. A lot of people commit suicide in those fabrics. I don't know what salary they get. The clothes, they're so cheap when they come to Europe. Everybody is working for nothing for Europe and for United States. We eat the bananas of Costa Rica, we eat the cacao of Africa, the Ivory Coast, there are child slaves who reap the cacao and all the, the treasures of the, of the earth or from whole Africa. There are so many treasures in the earth like silver, like whatever for the iPhones, all the materials for the electronics all comes from Africa and the governments just rape, just rape Africa of those wealth. And we Europeans, we profit from it and we are mocking God and even don't give thanks to God. And I started realizing how evil Europe is. Before when I lived in Europe, I didn't see this, I didn't realize, but when I finally came to a poor country, I started seeing how evil Europe is. It's kind of not our fault because we don't understand. If you live in this wealth, you don't understand how evil this is what you do. You think it's normal. You think everybody does in the whole world. You think everybody's an atheist. Everybody's mocking God. 
But as soon as you come to a poor country and see the Christian in his poor country, you get ashamed for Europe. You really get ashamed. And you see, oh my God, we have been blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed financially, you know. And God has been merciful on us, and God has been merciful on us, and God has been merciful on us. Of course, we are diligent. Of course, we are nice to one another. We practice a lot of and uh, love to one another we do this but uh, we mock God so much and we have homosexual marriage we have uh, gay parade and a lot of evil ugly stuff and yeah I don't want to start no, with all the sins of Europe and all, all this atheism who is rising and they make a religion out of atheism and they, they blame all the evil in the world to the Christian it's so fucking evil if you have been blessed and so wealthy and actually in Ezekiel it says that the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah God doesn't talk about homosexuality or sexual sins here. He says the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah was they had plenty of food, they had peace and everything, but they did not take care of the poor. That was the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they did abominations in my eyes, so I removed them. They did also abominations, but first he talks about their wealth, and they did not take care of the poor. That was the main guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's the main guilt of Europe. And, yeah, so, uh, I also started preaching way more strict to Europeans, and, but it's not fun. If I'm not much time in Europe anymore, maybe two months a year, three months a year, but when I'm in Europe, it's such, I get so much rejection because I started preaching judgment on the street. I start preaching judgment to the people, I show them the mirror how evil they are. And nobody loves me anymore, of course. But I show them in the mirror how evil they are, how blasphemous they are, and how they rip off the whole world of its wealth to, in order to profit and live a rich life. And people hate me for this, and it's always a hard time being in Europe. And I'm always kind of, I'm very happy to return to Nicaragua because people love me here very much. But I also had to change my preaching into a way more strict preaching. And of course, if you preach strict and if you preach judgment, people don't come to Christ. No, they, they hate you. But I say, okay, even though at the moment I preach this, they, don't, they might not come to Christ. But I know there's war coming to Europe because, because God's going to judge Europe for all its sins. So I'm not a prophet, but what I received from God, end of 2018, there's war in Europe. And so... Uh, I have to preach judgment because God's going to bring a war. And if I don't preach, no one preaches judgment, the mockers, they're also going to mock God even in the war. They're even going to continue to mock God also when the bombs are falling. They're going to say, yeah, why God allows this war? He doesn't exist. See, the, why is there war? God doesn't exist. If no one preaches judgment and everybody preaches, yeah, Jesus loves you, loves you, loves you, the mockers and the... the they are going to mock God also when the judgment is coming and the only chance they have to stop mocking is if they have been told in advance the judgment is coming so they have no excuse. They cannot blame God when the, when the war is coming that God why he allows the war because someone has told them why God allows the war and they are going to know it's their guilt why God allows the war if, if, my, if the sermon of judgment is coming to pass. And God is not speaking a different language to Europe. There, there's, here is terror, there is terror in London, in everywhere is, all the time there's some terror attack. And that's God speaking to the Europeans through the signs of the times. No? And the Europeans, they have grown, grown so, so departed from God, they even don't see the signs of the times anymore. No? In the 80s, in the 1980s, everybody knew it's dangerous. We could have World War Three, and everybody was praying. So the war doesn't come, and the war did not come. But everybody was afraid, so everybody prayed. But nowadays, people are not really afraid anymore. They mock and they blaspheme God, and no one prays. The war is not coming, so the war has to come. No? And uh, yeah, that's the situation of Europe. But actually, what I oftentimes miss of African preachers preachers is an attitude of mercy and this is something other very very important 
in fighting the spirit of poverty. And you can read this in Psalm 41. Psalm 41 is actually the history of Switzerland. Switzerland has a long Christian history and uh, actually we, we were a very, very important country in the Reformation like with, with Calvin in Geneva. Calvin, he was a French refugee from France. He was a French Christian that fled to Geneva and with Swingley in Zurich and also with the government of the canton of Bern, they, they accepted the Reformation and pushed the Reformation in the canton of Bern. Also Basel made Reformation. Uh, Colin Bard was a preacher in Basel. A lot of famous preachers were in Switzerland during the times of Reformation and also I think the Schlachter Bible comes from Switzerland, the Zürcher Bible, a lot of Bibles come from Switzerland, also the Geneva Bible that uh, was a great influence on the, on the uh, Calvinistic movement in the whole world, in the Anglo-Saxon world. And so Switzerland had a huge influence during, with, with the, uh, during the times of Reformation. But not only this, also 300 years ago, the French king, he was a Catholic, so they decided to kill all the, the Protestants, all the Christians, and they killed all the Christians, the Huguenots, and all those Huguenots, they fled to Switzerland. Most of them fled to Switzerland, some of them fled to Holland, to Netherlands, and others fled to Germany, but mo the most part, they fled to Switzerland. And, and also 100 years ago, there was a, a not a tremendous missionary movement, but there was a missionary movement from Switzerland. And as you all know, Ghana has been Christianized from missionaries from Basel, from Switzerland. And Basel, I also lived a long time in Basel. I do know the Basel mission. And also I do, I have heard, no, if you go to Ghana, I've never been to Ghana. I need to, I, finally, I need to go there sometime. But uh, I've heard if you go to Ghana and you say you're from Basel, everybody knows ba Basel in Ghana, no? <laughs> because it has been Christianized from Basel. And so those three factors, we did serve a lot the kingdom of God through the Reformation, through the helping the refugees and, and also through the missionaries. And that's the main reason of, of the economical blessing over Switzerland. And also why Switzerland got spared in two world wars. Because you can read it in Psalm 41. It says, Blessed is the one who takes care of the poor. He shall prosper in the land. Um, he, he shall prosper in the land. I don't know it in English. The Lord will save him in, in the evil times. He shall prosper in the land, and the Lord shall not give him into the hand of the will of his enemies. And you see, as a missionary, this is a tremendous protection. The Lord shall not give him into the hand of, hands of his enemies. If you go to a Muslim country, this is a tremendous promise from God. And so the mercy and serving the poor is a tremendous blessing and protection from God you need as a missionary. And I told you I've struggled for my life four times here in Nicaragua, but I do have the protection from Psalm 41 because my ministry is about homeless people. And the, the Psalm 41 says he does not give him into the will of his enemies. So the devil was not able to kill me. Even if he tried four times, he was not able because of that Psalm 41. Because that is, that is my inheritance before God. Because my ministry is about helping poor people. And also it's, it says he, he will be blessed in the land. So this is also a means of fighting the spirit of poverty. If you yourself fight poverty for your neighbor, for your, for, your, for your city, for your country, if you fight poverty for your country, you're going to be blessed with wealth yourself. That's also a very important means of fighting the spirit of poverty. And also for getting protection as a missionary. For example, if you go to a Muslim country, no, you need the protection. If you don't have the protection, you, you can... You can preach far, far, far less offen uh, offensive, but if you do have the protection, you can, you can preach way more boldly. No? You might run into trouble, but you do have the protection, so you can preach more boldly. 
but I've never been to a Muslim country, so I better don't try first to preach boldly. I better try to preach first securely and, and, and humbly and to, to look how it goes. No, but I've never been to a Muslim country. Maybe I go once, but uh, up to now I only have experience of being missionary in Nicaragua. And of course, in Nicaragua, being missionary is vacation. No? There's so much Christianity and the Holy Spirit is very happy in this country. And the main, main fight in this country is against poverty. No? And we have 35% Christians in Nicaragua, reborn Christians, evangelical Christians. So the main point in Nicaragua is fighting poverty. And because I want to help this country, I'm, I want to grow a, a, a missionaries movement in this country. That's very strong on my heart, to grow a missionaries movement from Nicaragua, because that was one of the key blessings for Switzerland. No, and you see that also in South Korea. We had a preacher from South Korea here last December, uh, the, the, the leader of InterCP. He was preaching about, about South Korea. He told us 50 years ago South Korea was the most poor country in the region and they made a huge conference. They promised to God, maybe 10,000 of Christians, they promised to God they're going to send out thousands of missionaries from South Korea. 50 years later, South Korea is the most wealthy country in the region because they have sent thousands of missionaries. They have served the kingdom of God so much and God has blessed this country tremendously. And so I realized, wow, you see the Nicaraguans, oftentimes they pray, Jesus, save Nicaragua, save Nicaragua, save Nicaragua. And I can just laugh. I say, that, well, what should I say? Switzerland has 2% reborn Christians, no more. And you are praying, God, save Nicaragua. Switzerland needs to be saved, or even the Muslim countries need to be saved. But Nicaragua, sorry, folks, Nicaragua is saved. What do you want to say? Of course, it's very easy to save people here because there's so much angels here in Nicaragua. So actually, if you pray for a sinner here in Nicaragua and Switzerland, you will pray five years and he wouldn't come to Christ. Here you pay, pray two weeks and this guy comes to Christ. So it's, it's easy to reap people here for Christ. But I said, hey, the heart of the Father is with the lost nations. It's with the Muslim nations that are lost, that never had a chance of hearing about Jesus. It's not the fault... Okay, in, in, Niger, in Niger, it might be something else. They had a chance to hear about Jesus. But like in Saudi Arabia, in, in Afghanistan, in, in, the, in the Russian countries where there are Muslims, they never had a chance to hear the gospel, to hear about Jesus. They grew up with this Quran rubbish. The parents taught them this Quran. How can you believe something else? It's not the fault of the people. And a lot of North African countries, they were Christian countries before Islam conquered those countries. So they were brethren. A long time ago, they were brethren nations. And Islam stole those nations from us Christians. And so we have the heart of the Father is with those nations, even though they are enemies of the cross. But the heart of the Father is with those nations to get them saved. And he's, of course, the heart of the Father is also for Nicaragua. But as I understand God, he's suffering more for the Muslim nations than for Nicaragua. His pain is, is more, his heart is more grieved for the Muslim countries. So his heart is more, gets more relief and more happiness if we follow Jesus and go to and preach to the Muslim countries. That's how I understand the heart of God. And, and I realized also there's a tremendous blessing in this coming upon the nations who send up, out those missionaries. Economical blessing. And so that's one means of helping this nation economically to grow a missionaries movement in this country. But, uh, so that was very strong on my heart. And what we want to do now, we want to start a missionary school here in Granada, mainly for Nicaraguans. And I, I don't have much experience. I, I do have a lot of experience in faith, in perseverance, and in, uh, and in, uh, yeah, and in, in mercy. So that's what I can teach those folks. And probably we're not going to send them to Muslim countries, we will see, because it might be dangerous. Because I had a past of rebellion, and that's not a good structure to build something upon that needs to be secure and, and uh, to send people into dangerous countries, no. But, uh, of, of course, I won't be the only teacher in that school. There will be a lot of other teachers. And uh, <laughs> I probably will not teach a lot about submission. And 
we need other folks teaching this no and uh, yeah but that's on my heart to grow a missionaries movement and so we need to found a school so Nicaraguans can grow as missionaries and one of the main problems Nicaraguans don't grow as missionaries is their lack of faith no? because they constantly are poor and no one can go to university no one can can travel the world because they lack money they they don't have this in their heads like wow oh, i would like to travel the world the nicaraguans they don't think like this because they're poor no and so i i thought when i came here hey, this is sad you as a swiss guy you have open doors you can go to everywhere you want to in the world and some swiss guy he will pay for you and those guys they don't get those chances no and but God owns all the money and so he can he can make possible everything the only thing that those people need is faith God will is gonna do it they need faith if they want to grow as a missionary God's gonna make it possible if they have money or no money it doesn't matter because God's gonna bless it because he will be so happy if they want to grow as missionaries God's gonna be so happy he's gonna provide all the money and I have heard a lot of testimonies of Nicaraguans that exactly happened this way God did provide a lot of money for them if they were at the, when they decided to grow into missionaries and so that's my part of my ministry is to encourage Nicaraguans to dream big dreams and not only small dreams because they're poor oftentimes they don't have the courage to dream big dreams and that's part of my ministry to 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 heat the fire so they can start growing dreaming big dreams of being missionaries, of changing the world for Jesus and not only Nicaragua and to start dreaming big dreams also for their lives even though they are poor and so that's what I want to encourage people here in Nicaragua to, to grow into missionaries and be a huge blessing for their country not by running around in Nicaragua and trying to, ever, to get everybody to come to Christ but by leaving this country like Abraham did and serving the heart of the Father and the heart of the lost nations and by this bringing way, way, way more blessing back to Nicaragua than by just running around in Nicaragua. So, okay. Thanks folks for listening. That's my two cents for Global Gospel Movement. And I'm very happy to have you African brothers. I love you African brothers. You're, you're Sorry, folks, you're, you're lovely people, you're wonderful people, and also you're great people of faith, because a lot of you folks, you come to Europe, it takes a lot of faith to leave Africa and to come to Europe. A lot of you folks, you're great men of God and great men of faith, and I do love you for it, and Jesus also loves you very, very, very much. He's so happy about you folks. And you see, actually, I'm so touched, because a lot of Guyanian people, they come to Switzerland and help Switzerland. Switzerland is lost. We are totally lost in atheism and abominations. And the, the Ghanaians, they come back to Switzerland and help us. And that's honoring your spiritual forefathers, no? And oftentimes I'm sad. I say that the Irish, they Christianized Switzerland a long, long, long time ago. But where are the Swiss people who go to Ireland and help the Irish? Because Ireland has a lot of problems. They, they have the religious war between the Catholics and the Protestants. And they have a lot of Catholicism and a lot of religious rubbish. They also need help. It's a poor country, Ireland. Where are the Swiss that go and bless their spiritual ancestors, the Irish? And the Africans, they have so sweet hearts. They come to Switzerland and bless us Swiss folks. We don't deserve this, man. We don't deserve your help. We have departed from God. We don't deserve it, but the Africans are so humble. They come and help this, this departed nation, that na this nation that so greatly departed from God. Even though the Swiss, even though, don't, even though don't help the Irish, what we actually should have to do. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for this, man. Thanks for your faithfulness. And you see, Europe is totally lost, and thanks for all the prayers for Europe. And sometimes I really, I'm out of, out of wisdom how we can still help Europe. But thanks for all the prayers. And yeah, and uh, if you want to be missionary in Europe, I, I, I need to give you an advice. What God showed me, there's, there's going to be war in Europe. 
what God showed to me end of 2018. I'm not a prophet. I might be wrong very well. It was a dream my roommate ha had. He dreamt it was 2000, end of 2018. was war coming to Europe. But as I'm not a prophet, it might be wrong. So might be there's no war coming. But I think, no, it's pretty sure there's war coming. You can read it in uh, Revelation 18 in Jeremiah 51. You can read the judgment over Europe. And I believe it's coming end of next year. But I'm not a prophet and I might be wrong. But if you plan to... To, pre to come to Europe to preach as a Christian, really please ask Jesus. If you come, you can come for like five months and then leave Europe again because Africa, I think it's going to be a safer, safer place than Europe. So ask Jesus if it's safe, if you really can come to Europe and if Jesus gives you green light, then come. But if Jesus doesn't give you green light, please don't come to Europe to preach or only for a short time. And also Europe is a great place to, to raise funds for your ministry. If you have a ministry in Africa, might be a good idea to come to Europe and to preach on the street for your ministry. I know a Mexican guy, he has a ministry in Romania. And every time he's broke, he comes to Switzerland like two months or one month and he, he's preaching on the street. He, he regularly gets 10,000 Swiss francs from in one month, but he's praying, of course. He's maybe two hours on his knees a day and he's getting like 10,000 a month and then he's going back to Romania and funds his, his ministry that way. So this might be a great idea but it's hard. You really have to preach on the street. I don't think you make 10,000 if you preach in churches. You need to preach on the street and every day, you know, every day you need to preach on the street and you're not very loved as a preacher on the street it's hard to get a lot of rejection well well he does it in a cool way he does he has some balloons and he's making balloons for the kids and he's not, i think he's he's not so much preaching he's mainly making uh clown and balloons and stuff like this but he told me he's making ten thousand every every trip he comes to switzerland and he said it's a miracle but but that's how he funds his ministry and <laughs> i was there last year three months and I I didn't make a dime <laughs> but uh, I just played a little bit guitar on the street and I'm a Swiss guy so Swiss people they think who is this guy he's just a street musician and they don't give me 10,000 of course but the Mexican guy he was yeah probably he had the, the foreigner bonus but as an African could be uh, some people they're racist and they I don't know how if it works or not he, you need to ask Jesus what to do. No, I, I have no idea. And it's expensive to come to Switzerland also. Might be cost more than 10,000. I have no idea. So it might be a bad idea. Might be a good idea. I don't know. And you need uh, also it's complicated to come to, to enter Europe. You need, uh, I think from Nicaragua, you don't need a visa, but you need some guy in Europe that guarantees for about $30,000. If you go to hospital, he guarantees for $30,000. And it's very hard to find someone in Europe who guarantees for you $30,000. It's very, very hard. I wanted to get one Nicaraguan guy last year to Switzerland and I called up maybe about 30 friends and no one was ready to guarantee those 30000 It was, It's hard to find someone. I think as an African it, it might be the same. If you only come three months, you need also this guarantee and it's, it's not easy to find someone with uh, for this guarantee. It's not easy, I think, to come in European Union from Africa. I don't know. You Probably you know better. Okay. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.